Hey there, welcome to the mastering section of this course. In this tutorial, we're going to review some mastering basics. Mastering is the processing and transfer of your final mix to a CD-ready file. Tasks you do while mastering include sequencing your songs, trimming the beginnings and endings, adding fade-ins and fade-outs, improving the consistency and uniformity across the songs, and adding some effects processing to bring out the best in your music. If you can afford it, mastering is best done by a professional. It's well worth your while and the additional expense. Historically, mastering began as the process of transferring final mixes first to vinyl, tape, and later to compact disc. As the discipline evolved, engineers discovered that a number of sound enhancements could be made during this process. Mastering involves 1. Final treatment to enhance sound and 2. Creating a CD in red book format. Mastering is an extensive subject requiring a lot of experience. This is where a professional can really make your music shine. A real pro can tweak your high-quality home studio music into a professional product. You use many of the same tools while mastering, dynamics processing such as volume, panning, EQ, as well as effects like reverb. However, your objectives while mastering are completely different. Mixing concentrates on the individual parts in a project, whereas mastering concentrates on the overall sound of the song and the album. Even though you may be using some of the same tools, your goals are different and the way you use the tools is different. For example, when you're adjusting volume during your mix, you're focusing on setting a bass line, the relative levels of the tracks, and you're watching for clipping on a solo track as well as the output master. When you're mastering, your focus is to maximize the volume. Mastering for levels is critical. An unmastered mix just can't compete with commercially recorded music that has gone through the mastering process. The unmastered mix will sound small and dull because a mastered mix's dynamic range has been optimized with EQ and volume maximizing to make the music sound bigger and louder. As we mentioned before, people usually perceive louder is better. Mastering engineers will use compressors and limiters to get the entire mix to the top of the digital dynamic range, zero decibels. They'll also know when it's too much, and they'll make sure that this doesn't flatten out the emotion in your song. When you're panning during mixing, you're thinking about the stereo pan laws and how they affect your sound, as well as the position of the instruments in your stereo field to ensure good balance and an interesting listening experience. But when you're mastering, you're making sure that the sound fills the stereo field and you use plugins to maximize the stereo expansion. When you're EQing your mix, you're thinking about the contribution each instrument makes to the mix. When you master with EQ, you use tools like multi-band exciters to bring out the best in the overall song and then across the album. Same thing with effects. During mastering, reverb applied to your stereo mix down will have a different sound than when it's applied to your mix. Compression in the mastering process will help you minimize fluctuations in volume and get a smoother and fuller sound across a song as well as the album. It's important that all the mixes sound like they belong to one CD. Watch for your consistency in loudness and dynamics. Not that everything has to be equally loud or the use of the frequency spectrum has to be identical, but you're looking for some general consistency. Can you mix and master at the same time? While it is possible, it's not a great idea simply because the goals of both processes are so different. For example, when you pan your mix, you're looking for the sweet spot for each instrument in the song. You've taken care to spread out the instruments in the stereo field. But when you master, you find that it somehow doesn't sound as wide or spacious as a commercial CD or that there's a lot of unevenness in the stereo images between songs. You'd apply a stereo expansion plugin to help manage this. Technically, mixing and mastering are also very different. 
Unlike mixing, where you deal with many tracks and complex routings, in mastering you take a series of stereo tracks and apply plugins as inserts on the tracks. Other than the fact that loudness maximizing and dithering should be last, there's no set order for the plugins. However, the order that you apply them will definitely impact the sound. Be aware of this and take the time to experiment. Some tips if you're doing your own mastering. Insert your dithering plugin as the last insert. Do not use compressed file formats like MP3s for your master. Don't master with headphones only. Make sure you're hearing it aloud in the stereo field. It's a good idea to test your final mix on different stereos in different environments, on your iPod, your car stereo, your house boombox. People will be listening to your work in these different environments, but your high quality sound equipment will help you find the trouble spots. You may need to go back and forth on the mastering a few times to get consistency across your songs. It is not a one-stop adjustment. Reference a professionally recorded CD in your genre whose sound you'd like to emulate. Check the EQ and reverb settings. See how yours sounds when played right after. Does it fit in or does it seem too low or too flat, too dull? After you finish, give it a rest for a couple days and then listen again. What sounded good or bad yesterday will sound different today. Don't master on tired ears. Do it fresh. Invest in a good mastering plugin. Ozone, that's what I use, is actually a great mastering plugin. It gives you strong EQ and volume maximizing tools. And for the rest of this section, we'll be applying ozone to a final mix down on a stereo track. Effects we'll be looking at are dynamics, to adjust the dynamics of specific frequencies like adding punch to bass or warmth to vocals. We'll need a multi-band compressor for this. We'll be looking at EQ to shape the tonal balance. We'll check out some reverb to add sheen to the mix. We'll widen the perceived width and image of the sound field with a stereo widener. We'll use a harmonic exciter to add sparkle. We'll apply a loudness maximizer to increase the loudness of the mix, while simultaneously limiting the peaks to prevent clipping. Then we'll dither for our CD glass master from 24-bit to 16-bit. Remember, the order you apply the tools has a huge impact on the sound. Just keep your loudness maximizer and dithering for last. The order of effects that I've listed above is a good sequence to start with. As your skill improves, you may decide that another strategy works best for you. It really depends upon your personal preferences as well as your genre. Okay. First, let's have a listen to a piece. I'm going to use Cubase, and I'm wondering if you can hear some problems with this piece that we can try to fix with the mastering process. Let's stop the playback. Okay, some elements that I have noticed. The song is not loud enough. I'm not sure if you can hear that through your computer speakers for this tutorial, but when I put it next to a commercial CD and play it, I've got to turn up the volume much higher and it still doesn't sound loud enough and it also sounds kind of dull. If I crank the volume too high, it actually distorts. I also don't think there's enough sparkle when I compare it to a commercial CD. My voice doesn't ring out, nor do the colors of the unusual instruments and the harmonies on this neat song. They don't hit the listener the way I want them to. The contrast of the acoustic guitar and the weird strings should have more emotional impact, and I'd really like to hear more of the guitar note highs. 
The vocal sounds thin to me and conflicts spatially and frequency-wise with the accordion. The bass is pretty muddy. The panning is too centered, even though I thought I spread things out during the mixing process. I really notice it with my vocals and the accordion. And then the bass line and the strings conflict also. So these two frequency bands really bunch up this mix. Here's the ozone interface with some of the mastering tools I spoke about previously. Reverbs, equalizers, dynamics, maximizers, etc. Here's some meters and graphs to help you out, although professional masterers might not need the meters as much as we do. They hear the sound and know its frequency. They hear a level and know when it's compressing too much. If you're mastering your own stuff, you're going to need the meters and displays as well as your ears. This concludes our introduction to the mastering process. In my next video, we'll take a look at mastering EQ.